All right, so in the first lecture, we went through benchmarking. How do I manage my process, and where should my E&M distribution be? How can I, with maximal compliance, optimize my RVUs and payment? And by the way, just sort of building on Kevin's theme, how many folks are dedicating their lives to getting the next level Lexus? That's it, man. I'm, I need the bigger Lexus. How many, if they had 10% more money, might work 10% less shifts or increase coverage 10% to mitigate burnout factors? So this all, this all ties together. The driver is patient-centric care, but the fuel are providers, and revenue that allow that to happen. So let's find out where the RVUs are now that we've talked about it. So here's our homage to Nashville guitar. And in this 30 minutes, we're gonna go track down the 83% of the RVUs that make up the body and most of the neck of the guitar and critical care that makes up the final 8%. We'll go through the basics, couple of compliance pitfalls, and then those really down in the weeds, but basic and easy to understand differences Three verse four, four verse five, five verse critical care. This represents 100 million paid claims, 100 million paid claims. And at the top, the percentages are not the E&M distribution, they are the contribution in dollars related to each code. 40% of the money, 40% of the money came from 99285. So if there were $100 million out of these claims, $40 million came from 99285. 30% came from 84, and 12% came from 99283, 8% from critical care. Very negligible contribution from levels one and level two. And if we look at the difference between a three and a four, the RVUs and payments, corresponding payments, 1.57 RVUs increase going from a three to a four, the same exact number, it's not that way every single year, but it is right now, going from a four to a five. So that three, four difference is just as important as that four, five difference. And then critical care, 1.39 RVUs. 70% of our revenue comes from just two codes, 70%. So let's figure out how to make sure that the coders and the coding process can reflect the high complexity work that we're already performing at the bedside. So all the way back in 1995, when maybe about 20% of this room was, was practicing, there were the 1995 documentation guidelines. They're 24 years old, and they're actually going to change now. They're not going to change right away, and they're not going to change for emergency medicine at any clear time in the future, but we can get a sense of the direction that Medicare is going. 1995 documentation guidelines still in play right now for all the patients being seen in our shops, this year, next year, the year after. Four HPI for level five, four HPI for level four, 10 review of systems for level five, eight physical exam organ systems, and two from the past family social history. All right, we've now done a review. There's your reference. Now, speaking of burnout and tying together themes here, the federal government is actually aware that burnout is an important issue. This is from Seema Verma, and this is one in a series of letters, open letters written to the House of Medicine. And the D.C. government apparatus, the federal government, they're actually fairly self-critical in these letters. This is written to the AMA and multiple other specialty societies. We've heard repeatedly that a major source of burnout is the documentation burden associated with evaluation and management coding, and that a change is long overdue. Clinicians find themselves having to perform and document clinical activity that's of only marginal benefit and relevance to the visit, but it's required in order to receive fair and accurate payment. Wow. Amen. They might, she must have just heard Kevin's lecture. We're all dying a death by a thousand clicks. You look at the medical record. The ep how many have an epic record that's 12, 14 pages long, right? Cerner could be longer. Meditech. Vital signs repeated 16 times throughout the record. And then, God forbid, the patient's admitted, then it all really gets, gets jumbled up. We're going to see some change. We're going to get a little bit of relief. But we want to understand where the puck is moving. Skate there and get there first. 
2019 Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule went into effect January 1 of this year, 2019 and 2020. So this year, next year, no change to any E&M codes. Now, we live in the ED world, but there's office visit codes, there's observation codes, there's consult codes, there's lots of stuff. And in fact, the ED codes that we've been talking about, they represent really a tiny fraction. The office visit codes represent by far the largest reporting of Medicare services and other payer services that are out there. In 2021, so about two years from now, a little bit less than that, the office visit codes are moving away. This is a final rule. It's published, done, sealed in the Federal Register, moving away from the 1995 documentation guidelines. So that's a good bellwether for us. Hey, maybe there could be some changes in the future to our codes. The office visit codes are moving to time and medical decision making. And in the audit world already, since most records, rather than being under-documented with regard to history and physical exam, the payers are sort of saying, hey, we think that they're maybe over-documented and we're going to perform our audit related to medical decision making. The ED codes, 99281 through 99285, that 83% of our RVUs, they do not have typical times published in the CPT manual. And right in the book, it says time is not a factor. So if the office visit codes, which represent the vast majority of the budget related to E&M services, are moving to medical decision-making in time, and time doesn't apply to us, and we're already starting to see audits that focus on medical decision-making, the puck is moving to medical decision-making. In one year, two years, six months, there will be an increased emphasis on our medical decision-making documentation. The other thing is, again, the goal isn't the bigger Lexus, it's clinical quality. Good medical decision-making notes, and we'll, we'll review a bad note, medical legal mitigation, clinical quality so that the next team that takes over, whether it's the inpatient team, a consultative team, your partner, you when you see the patient back two weeks later, can make sense out of that note. And here's the quote. The proposed changes only apply to the office or outpatient visit codes 99201 through 15. We understand there are more unique issues to consider in other settings such as the emergency department. But change is afoot and medical decision making will become more and more important over the next six months, 12 months. We're gonna spend a couple of minutes and develop some best practices knowing that that is our future. How many not using voice recognition dictation of some sort? Got a couple of hands, shy hands, a couple of shy hands. There's no reason to not document a robust HPI on every patient. It simply is describing to the payer why the patient came to the emergency department took care of their $140 on average copay, waited a little bit of time because pull till full, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, seven o'clock on a Monday, all the beds are filled, they waited an hour to be seen. We can really, really easily, using voice recognition, document a robust HPI. And that is the beginning of our medical decision-making process. Here's an example. Both of these records were under audit. HPI, 84-year-old female, lots of history. History of CAD, cabbage, hypertension, this is all free text. Recently evaluated by her PMD, newly diagnosed with diabetes. Currently on meds, patient was attempting to climb onto a chair, slip, fell, injuring her hip. Patient ultimately had a hip fracture, and there's only two or three HPI elements here, but there's a lot of good clinical information, but we didn't quite get it over the finish line. Or, Patient complains of sudden onset of right-sided chest tightness. I've got location. I've got a quality. While mowing the lawn, I've got context around 10.30 a.m. Now I've got the timing throughout the day. And now I've got some associated signs and symptoms with nausea and a severity. The chest tightness is severe. Much better record. No reason using the microphone to not be in the habit of a nice, well-developed HBI for really every patient encounter. Some basic math. Eight-hour shift. Two patients per hour, I'm going to fully see, treat, and disposition, 16 patients, three RVUs per patient, let's say the work RVUs, 48 RVUs. I got six RVUs an hour, where I have one HPI down code. So that record, that's like Dr. Red that we showed in the first lecture. We've lost 39% of the revenue 
for that patient. 4.89 down to 1.75 RVUs, a loss of 3.14 RVUs, and we went from six RVUs an hour to 5.6 RVUs an hour, big decrement. HPI, voice recognition dictation, that's the beginning of a best practice. There's another reason why the HPI is so helpful. There's an increasing culture among the payers of making allegations related to overuse of macros. The payers, including Medicare, on record, macro, totally fine, macro for the physical exam, macro for the review of systems. What would happen if nobody in this room used macros? At 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. or 11 p.m. on Monday, a weak and dizzy 80-year-old would die in the lobby while we were click, 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 click our individual review of systems elements. So we're in the job of saving lives and the documentation, that's part of our tool or at times a hurdle to get through. Macro is totally acceptable, but there's a strategy to be used now and going forward. It's not only the federal government, but the private payers. This is Blue Cross. Thank you for taking time to meet with the Fraud Investigation and Protection Unit. They really, they, they give themselves these really intimidating titles. I have literally twice now showed up for a meeting with a group, not this exact group, but a payer fraud unit, and they had badges. And we actually asked, do you work for the county? Do you work for the state? Did we, at one point, our attorney said, did, did we come to the wrong room? What's going on? Fraud Investigation Protection Unit. In brief, FIP has found a significant portion of the computer-generated documentation submitted by you was identical, pre-populated, or copied, identical notations for different patients with different problems. In several instances, the language was exactly the same. Most of the physical exam was identical. So the chest pain patient that I see in room three at 4 p.m., in room seven at 6 p.m., and in room 13 right at the end of my shift, you know what that physical exam is? It's exactly the same. Sure, it is. So how can we document appropriately and avoid that allegation. And it's a practical application of the 95 documentation guidelines. We actually were able to get that physician past this audit. There was a hard request, a withhold of $94,000 for that one provider related to the allegation of cloning from the local Blue Cross carrier. You know what saved the day? He had phenomenally detailed HPIs that showed, no, no, no there's lots of patient-specific information I've used a legitimate and acceptable tool, a macro for the review of systems and the physical exam. The HPI made all the difference. Talked about why the patient came, why they were presenting, what the differential diagnosis was, what the treatment course was. For HPI, let's put that aside. If we look at the review of systems, you only need two review of systems for up to and including level four. Only two, that's pretty scant. And if we look at the physical exam, depending on the scoring grid that you're using, you need either two or maybe five physical exam organ systems, and one of them is the vital signs, for up to and including a level four. So what most sophisticated coding education processes involve now is, hey, let me think about a small macro for my less complex patients and a big macro for my more complex patients. I don't know, Mike, I'm a bedside doc, I'm really interested in patient care, I'm, I'm on the edge of burnout, I can only remember three things, Give, make it simple, no problem. Quick treat and street, otitis media, laceration, tonsillitis, small macro, and build for yourself, and I think most of us in the reimbursement world would prefer a macro that's kind of uniform across the group, but doesn't have to be. Build for yourself, this is my small macro, these are the three or four review of systems questions I always ask. This is my quick vital sign and heart, lung, abdomen exam that I do on everybody, which is what, what I personally do. And those quick treat and street patients, I use my small macro. The higher complexity patients, I use my big macro for review of systems and physical exam. And what are the higher complexity patients? They're all the acuity predictors that we talked about. Admit, transfer, consults, and then high complexity testing. That could be cross-sectional imaging, ultrasound, CAT scan. That could be high complexity laboratory tests, things that a 
primary care physician might not do in their office, CPK, troponin, BNP, D-dimer. You're doing the more complex stuff, use your big macro. Quick treat and treat, use your small macro with a robust HPI. Now you're creating a chart that is starting to glide through the audit process. And we've got two tools to be aware of. One comes from Medicare, one comes from CPT. Medicare, right in the 1995 documentation guidelines, we don't anticipate this going away, states that if we can't get a full history from the patient, we just need to state why. Patient has significant aphasia status post-stroke, history exam, history limited by. If the physician is unable to obtain a history from the patient or other source, the record should describe the circumstances you're then excused from the full extent of the history. And then what if the patient is simply very sick? Maybe they're not quite critical care, but they're very, very sick. 99285 requires comprehensive history, comprehensive exam, high-level medical decision-making, but within the constraints imposed by the urgency of the patient's clinical condition or mental status. So go ahead and invoke that acuity caveat, and you're then excused from the full complement of history and exam. It's a nice tool. These two items, they make the charts look different, and you'll select out three, four, five percent of your records fall into this, and now all of a sudden your records start to look a little bit distinct. So let's put it all together with the best practice. Four HPI for most presentations, fine. Small or large macro for physical exam and review of systems, depending on the complexity. Complete past medical history, social history, fine and then use the two tools, the history caveat and the acuity caveat. There's your documentation best practice. The last thing though is, that's the compliance angle. Now how do I make sure that the coders understand the higher complexity work that I'm doing at the bedside? And that's the medical decision making. And that's the key area. That's where all of the office visit codes are going in less than two years. That's where I'm already seeing the audits in the ED space going currently. So let's take a deep dive into medical decision making. Uh, in honor of March Madness, you know, if you lecture a lot, you gotta, you gotta keep it a little interesting. We're gonna go with the March Madness theme here and use, use the basketball points. There are three components of medical decision making. There is one area that is particularly under the control of the treating physician with regard to documentation. It's kind of on us to document it. And that's the portion called data. You need four data points, four data points to support a component of a level five. Doesn't mean you get four data points, it's automatically a level five, but you're part of the way there and moving down the track. So how do I get data points? How many have old records not available to them? Not available electronically. No hands. We all look at the old record for the 78-year-old COPD -er in room 17 that we're like, yeah, I kind of remember seeing her a month or two ago. Let me see, last course of steroids, ever been intubated before? What were some of the problems during the prior admission? You can review the last ED visit, you can review an old EKG, you can review an old radiology report, and then write a tiny, a one sentence summary. 2519, patient was admitted to the hospital, they had a TIA, Carotid Doppler's normal, less than 50% occlusion, went home on aspirin. I just scored two of the four points that I need to support a level five, where 40% of the, all of my revenue comes from. I'm halfway there by that simple sentence. Here are the other ways to get points. You talk to somebody else about the case or you get history from somebody else. Does anybody admit a patient by just pressing the staples button, and they like, they just go upstairs. And if so, if so, please leave your business card here so I can send a resume, because I want to work there. We all talk to the hospitalist, plus or minus one additional call to either consultant or the primary care physician. Documentation of that phone call scores me another two points. So for all of my admitted patients, I have a pathway to the four points required to support one element of level five. Now you can talk to the family, you can talk to the primary care physician, EMS, review those notes, review the nursing home notes, fine. The Medicare admission rate is about 50%, the national Medicare level five rate is about 55, 
Admission doesn't equal level five, but man, there's, what did I say? There's an R squared correlation of about 70% of admission as an acuity predictor. So all these admitted patients, I start with my nice HPI, I use my macros, and then I document my data on most of the way home for most of the patients that end up with level five, the majority of patients. And just so you have it as a reference, here are the other ways that data is scored. You order a clinical lab test, a radiology test, a medicine test. What's a medicine test? An EKG is a medicine test. CPT code 93010, it's from the 9000 section, the medicine section of CPT. Decision to obtain old records is kind of gamesmanship, frankly, in today's day and age, because like, we just go and look them up, but that's still in the audit tool. And then independent visualization of image, tracing, or specimen. If you're in an academic institution and take the time to actually look at a gram stain of something, by all means, that's a lot of work. Get two points for it. We all read our own EKGs. You get two points for that. And then if you independently visualize your own x-rays or CAT scans, particularly at night looking at a head CT, you don't have to be billing for it, but document that you visualize a CT scan, you score another two points. That is the area of medical decision-making that is under our control. Medical decision-making is where the puck is moving to. It's already, it's already left the stick, and it's moving in that direction. Now let's try and really hone down on a practical application, three verse four, four verse five. A tiny bit of in-the-weeds coding theory. This is as far as we'll go. We've talked about the history. I need four HPI. I need 10 review assistance for a level five. We've talked about the exam, and we've started to talk about medical decision-making. Those three areas represent the key elements. CPT actually lists seven areas. The big differentiator between level three and level four in today's day and age with the use of macros and EHRs is specifically communicating the urgency of the patient's presenting problem. The urgency, and it's kind of what it sounds like. like if it's just kind of a layup, ankle sprain, that doesn't sound urgent. If it's an asthmatic patient in an MVA that's boarded in collar, that's clearly urgent. And then there's a lot of stuff that falls in between. So we've got some examples in the back of CPT. These examples were written in 1992. They're beyond legacy. They're almost vestigial, but they're out there and available to us. 99283, localized complaint. Female complaint of vaginal discharge denies, the example calls out, denies abdominal pain or back pain. Corollary, 99284, right in the CPT book, in the book that when I go in front of the administrative law judge or we go to arbitration, I get out the book and I point and I like, see here, this is a systemic problem. It's a level four. Female presenting with lower abdominal pain and vaginal discharge. We went from just a discharge to a systemic problem. Well-appearing eight-year-old with fever, diarrhea, and abdominal cramps, tolerating oral fluids, not vomiting, or I've got an adult driver, status post MVA, immobilized. Real-world record, level three, verse four. Five-year-old male, fever, nausea, and anorexia, calling out all of these non-localized complaints, not ankle sprain stuff. I've got anorexia, I've got abdominal pain. Discussed with mother risks and benefits of imaging a lab, she agrees to serial exams, now, it's an hour and 25 minutes later. Repeat exam shows persistent, now moderate nausea, but the belly exam is good. Two o'clock, we give the kid a popsicle. We write another repeat assessment. Child goes home. 99284, upheld under audit. Same group, different provider, not using voice recognition, not a great typist, similar presentation. ED course, patient has some diarrhea and nausea. Treated Tylenol and Zofran, given for mild nausea, home improved. Now, how many like the clinical quality of the top record? I like it. How many are a little uncomfortable and have no real transparency into the patient's clinical course with the bottom record? Yeah. So here we're intertwining sort of the reimbursement triple aim, which is clinical quality, which comes first, medical legal mitigation, and sure, it's good for reimbursement. Nine, nine, two. So that's the way that we get from a three to a four. It's the urgency. Where does that urgency come across? In our medical decision-making note, and it's very clinical. We want to go from a local process to a systemic process or concern. Nine nine two eight five. 
the same difference, 1.57 RVUs between a three and a four and a four and a five. 40% of our RVUs and revenue come from this one code. We want to document it correctly. The comparative billing reports are looking in this area. Comprehensive history and exam, fine, we got that. We can use our big macros, nice robust HPI. Now we, we've talked about data already, so I'll go to the bottom of that. Extent of amount and complexity of data. You need four points to support a level five. We talked about how to get the points. Document the conversation with the admitting physician, review the old record. If you get history from somebody else, document it very clearly. There's lots of good clinical and medical necessity reasons for that. The other components. We need one of these other components to be at sort of a high level. Extensive number of diagnosis and management options. It's a differential diagnosis, a robust differential diagnosis. We're like never lose under audit if there's a good differential diagnosis and a discussion of the ED course. So the nine-year-old male brought from the soccer field with a complaint of chest pain, it could be bronchospasm, it could be a chest wall contusion, it could be a pneumothorax. I look at the kid, I look at the vital signs, I auscultate very carefully in all the lung fields, I perform a chest x-ray, no pneumothorax. Great differential, easy level four case, if well documented. Discussion of clinical concerns, and then summarize what happened in the ED, because what the auditors are saying is, hey, I don't know, there's a lot of tests, but I don't really know what all that stuff means. I just see some CYA testing that took place using protocol-driven orders. Describe to me what you're looking for. The patient came in with COPD that had a respiratory rate of 28. They had some mild accessory muscle use. I reviewed the old record. They were on steroids not that long ago. We're going to do a chest x-ray. We're going to check some routine labs, start nebulizer treatments. They require an hour of nebs. We're going to restart the steroids. We document a conversation with they're a pulmonologist, and they ultimately go home. That's a level five discharge case. We went through the ED course, the differential diagnosis, and what we we're concerned about. And then the last area is what's called risk. And these are sort of semantic words, a severe exacerbation. So the word severe in the coding world sort of translates into high risk, a severe exacerbation of COPD. It slots into a little box on the grid. And then there are two sort of very, very granular, very concrete issues, which is abrupt change in mental status or use of parenteral narcotics, most of us using less of that. So I'm going to move through this. We're going to spend about two minutes on critical care. Most of us undervalue critical care. 99291, the critical care CPT code, has 1.4 RVUs more than 99285. Over an eight-hour shift, you identify two critical care patients, you've gone up 0.35 RVUs per hour. Big difference. As we get comfortable with more and more sick patients, we start to think, oh, the sphincter tone isn't off the meter here. Maybe it's not critical care. AFib with RVR. So when the dinosaurs walked around, and I was a resident and an intern, we gave verapamil to these patients. And we knew it was critical care because their blood pressure was like 70 and squeezing fluid in. Usually they had like tiny IV access. And now you're like, give yeah, some cardizem, it's okay. And, and if they get real sick, what do we do? Cardiovert, no big deal. Those were huge, huge. When the critical care examples were written, those were huge, huge interventions. Rapid AFib with cardizem, critical care. Other presentations, symptomatic SVT. If they get the adenosine in the field and convert, and they're like, you know, sort of just sitting on the gurney, and you're checking some thyroid, some baseline labs, that's hard to make critical care. Active chest pain. So that means the patient has chest pain, or they have EKG changes with an anginal equivalent. It's a very common overlooked presentation, and then non qa Respiratory conditions. This patient. Patient comes in, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, nice, robust differential diagnosis, and what we're looking for with these cases is a hard findings, an abnormal vital sign, and an intervention. CO2 88, slow mentation. I'm going to put the patient on BiPAP. Maybe that patient goes to the ICU in your facility. If you're in a tertiary care facility, maybe they don't go to the ICU. They do not need to go to the ICU in order to be critical care. And then the metabolic presentations, these patients have defined meaningful mortality rates, 
but things don't happen lickety split with a whole lot of drama at the bedside with the DKA patient. Nonetheless, this is an opportunity for critical care. I've got a hard finding. My bicarb is seven, my sugar is 509. Intervention, insulin drip. Some benchmarking. You can benchmark your ICU admission rate. Certainly all of those should be critical care. I mentioned in the first lecture, 0.2 to 0.3 times the overall admission rate. That would be your critical care rate. There's national data for every single state. Some folks have emailed me already for state-specific data. You can email me for critical care data. Nationally, for Medicare, for Medicare, 7.4%. So let's put it all together. Accurate h and documentation, 83% of our RVUs, 40% comes from level five. Small macro, if the patient is quick treating street, larger macro, if it's a higher complexity case, document your data, four data points gets us halfway to a level four, and then don't forget critical care. Again, my information is here, very happy. I've already had a lot of nice email correspondence with folks. Thank you very much.